As they're taking their seats and settling down, I'd like to remind you of the voting for this panel. The question is, how should the relationship of democracy and business be changed? Thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to my panelists. Um, so the, uh, obviously, we live in a world where, uh, in many ways, the business of our countries is business. Uh, we, we live in a world where there are very strong corporate actors, uh, lots of concentration of private wealth, and at the same time, most of our societies are at least notionally, and, and we hope to some extent functionally democratic, raises all kinds of questions about the relationship both ways. Is democracy good for business? Is business good for democracy? What do, what do businesses do? Um, and I'm going to try to recede a little bit into the background and, and see what we can get out of our very, very well-informed panelists. I want to start with uh, Yasheng, um, the, uh, talking a little bit, the question is, uh, how, how reconciled it, are business interests to democratic processes? What, to what extent is it, there is this longstanding, uh, there, there have been historical episodes where business, many business people are, seem to have, have, think that autocracy will solve some of the messiness. Uh, do you want to talk about what you, what you see on that now? So, so before we talk about business and democracy, we do need to talk about business and autocracy. So, right. so Trump you know, is a clear example of worshiping uh, Putin. Uh, he hasn't declared his uh, worship of President Xi Jinping. Uh, maybe he can't pronounce his name. <laughs> but historically, uh, there have been prominent business people who praised autocratic regimes. Going back to the 1920s and 30s, uh, Armand Hammer, and then uh, Fred uh, Koch, who built refineries both in Hitler's uh, Germany and Stalin's uh, Russia, Soviet Union. Right? And contemporary, uh, uh, there are contemporary business people who praise uh, China. So I think the evidence is pretty strong that there's this affinity between some business people and autocracy. I think the, the deeper question is why. Um, there could be two reasons. One is a pragmatic reason. So if you look at the autocracies, autocracies like to control tangible things, right? Energy uh, and land, right? So maybe for the necessity of business, you have to sing the praise of autocrats because these are the assets that, that the autocrats uh, control. Interestingly, both in the United States and China, the obstacles to reforms tend to come from the energy sector. Uh, and in the 1970s, the reformist leaders broke up the petroleum gang to open up the reforms. Right? And, but the other reason could be an ide ideological one, uh, which is that there are many, many strong business people who see a replica of autocracy in their own organizations. Okay. Right? So, so maybe there's that as well. Uh, and, but it's one thing if the autocracy, so that is, is the second, I was going to ask, because uh, kowtowing, couldn't use that, uh, politically incorrect, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, showing obeisance to an existing autocrat is one thing a business person, you can easily see them doing, but it's this longing for autocracy in societies that don't currently have it. And you're saying that this is at least partly because the CEOs see in the autocrat uh, an image of themselves or a, a glorified version of themselves. Well, I think many CEOs deplore politics. Right. Right. So there was a, a 1972 Fortune magazine article praising Brazil. Uh, and Brazil, by the way, at that time was viewed as an economic miracle. Uh, Brazil was ruled by a military uh, junta. Right. It, it was praising Brazil for absence of politics. Right. So, so CEOs, they rule their own companies as top strong right. men without politics, right? What they don't quite understand is that politics has to come somewhere. So if you don't have this kind of politics, then somebody else is bearing the cost. It turns out in autocracies, it's the common people, it's the rural people who bear the tremendous cost of autocracy. Right. Uh, so you're talking about autocracies controlling tangibles. Ross, you're in the the ultimate intangible company. Um, want to talk about, about that, how, how the information sector sees all of this. Sure. I think the first thing I have to say, though, is although I'm on a panel with three very renowned economists, I'm the only uh, person representing a business. I don't think the 
Is my mic on now? <laughs> so technology now problem it's on. for a tech guy. I was saying uh, that uh, on a panel with three renowned economists, I'm the only one representing a business. But I think it's uh, a bit facile to talk about democracy and business. There's really no such thing. There are many different industries, uh, many different ways of uh, having a business. And even within an industry like ours, like Google's, which is information, technology, the internet, there are many different uh, business models, many different philosophies, many different ways of operating a business. So I can only speak for Google right. and say that for our business, when we talk about the internet, when we talk about innovation, we talk about technology, it's pretty clear that it has been a fantastic driver of democracy. It's, it's allowed voices that were never heard before. It's uh, progressed communications and connections among people, and it's, uh, it's allowed access to information and a level of transparency that we've never seen before. Now, this is messy. This doesn't mean that uh, this is an easy thing uh, and that the world suddenly becomes much easier to understand. In many ways, it can be more difficult to understand in this flood of information and connection. But even though it's messy, it's a good thing. It's wonderful, really. Um, and what I think I've just described when I talk about this mix of messiness and a flood of information and connection sounds very similar to democracy itself, really. The question, uh, though, I mean, some of the democracy isn't only about having voices heard. It's also about some protections, about uh, res respect for, I mean, uh, respect for things like privacy. And uh, there is at least some potential conflict. The, this wide open um, flow of information um, can, I mean, there, there are, for example, there, there are issues of uh, um, fairness, of, of, of uh, slander. We have in Europe about the right to, for, to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had the, some really, uh, I mean, Facebook is having these terrible problems with their algorithms trying to provide a news feed which ends up getting conspiracy theories at the top of the list. Uh, what's, what's your view on all of that? Where, where does that balance get struck? There are certainly, you're absolutely right, there are certainly uh, many difficult questions and many challenges we're facing. Um, but I remind us all that this is early days for the internet. I remember a time not so long ago when we didn't have the devices that we have today. We didn't have the connections or the benefits of technology that we have today. Some of us may yearn for that time again, but I think the proof uh, of the value of this technology is all I have to do is look out into the audience right now and see hundreds of devices lit up right now, hundreds of faces lit up by devices. Uh, I think that is proof in and of itself of the power of this technology and the power of this for good. There's there is the special experience of trying to teach classes and everyone is looking at a device and you hope that they're taking notes but they might very well be watching. Can I just address that one point? Yeah. I really think that, as I said, it's early days, but I think we as a society have a very pressing challenge which is to train our kids and teach our kids how to be digital citizens. I mean, I have two young nieces We've taught them, you know, look both ways before you cross the road, some very basic things that every child is taught. Yet when we look at how powerful and instrumental the internet is to our lives today and how incredibly powerful it will be in the future, we're simply not doing enough, not only to teach our kids how to use this thing, but to address some of the issues you raised, Paul, which are don't believe everything you see online. Uh, protect yourself and your privacy online, and how to be digital citizens. It's an incredible responsibility uh, to be online and to be a digital citizen, and we really need to be very proactive in addressing that challenge. Um, Yanis, um, so you and I share some concerns about, uh, about, not so much about democracy, or at least I put it, less, less the cosmic issue of democracy versus autocracy as the, the way that business may affect or distort uh, the, the decisions that are taken within a notionally democratic uh, uh, society. And I, I know you have some views uh, on this. I, I might want to 
come back a bit and, and, and some of the things, that, some of the things that I, I would have dismissed as being uh, you know, too, too, uh, too harsh uh, a few years ago, but no longer do. But I'd like to hear what you have to say on that uh, line. Well, democracy is and ought to be about the dispersion of power. Uh, Aristotle defined it as a constitution in which the poor, um, who are by definition the majority, um, have a major influence on collective decision making. Um, now, maybe not the poor, but, but we have a, an increasing inequality, not just of income, but also of power, uh, with the rise of conglomerates like Google and others. The problem is not technology. Technology is utterly liberating, so I agree entirely with you. Um, and I welcome everything that you do in order to push further the barrier of uh, our technological capacity. But the, the, the question always was, from the 19th century in political economy, in political science, in the debates around liberalism, democracy, and later, um, liberal democracy. We must not confuse liberalism with democracy necessarily, because some of the great liberals were not in favor of democracy. Uh, so th those, those discussions were always about ways of blending political pluralism and collective decision-making, democratic decision-making, with economic power. Now, if you look at the 19th century debates, it was all about how competition keeps business honest and therefore democracy possible. Uh, but today we have an increasing diminution of competition due to technological change. Um, you know, we hear from people from Sil Silicon Valley like Peter Thiel of PayPal that competition is now a relic of history. I think I'm quoting him very specifically. So if competition is a relic of history and you have um, the power that these folks have, uh, who is going to keep checks and balances on them? Now, I have no doubt that they are enlightened uh, <laughs> businessmen and women, and they understand the importance of having a Leviathan overseeing them in order to make the democratic process um, feasible. But, the, but then you need to have a uh, business which is at an arm's length from government. And unfortunately, we have increasing evidence of capture, of revolving doors between corporations. And let me just add one last wrinkle before we continue our round robin. Uh, there are three threats to democracy from the rise of business power. One, of course, is uh, the banking sector. The second one is the media. These two sectors are uh, seriously problematic because of a monopoly that they have. The banking sector has a monopoly over the payment system. They are not just businesses. They are like the uh, arteries of the economy. So th therefore, they are too big to fail. The media have direct input in what, into what people think. Therefore, it's not, they are not just providing a good or a service. They have a capacity to, to do the worst kind of authoritarianism possible, which is to input into our mind ideas that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And then, of course, is the, uh, the rise of monopoly. So these are the challenges for restoring a balance between the political realm and the economic realm. And I'm afraid that the political democratic realm is not doing very well. Okay. Uh, I was just going to ask, and maybe I, I'll de derail us slightly, but I was going to ask, I mean, it's been, uh, you and I have been in different ways railing against the policies adopted since the Great Recession, which have been, uh, and, uh, but I was, have never been clear on uh, I, to what extent business influence has weighed in. How much, how much of austerity and all of that is reflecting business influence? How much of it is just reflecting the, the, the ideology of the commission, how much of it is reflecting just German auto liberalism, whatever. What, what, did, did, did you see business as, as playing an important factor in all of that? I think I will side with Ross here. We must not conflate business. Okay. Um, those who are actually producing goods and services, uh, tangible services and uh, you know, glasses and smartphones, uh, they don't have any interest in the deflationary politics of austerity that have been implemented uh, for the last five, six years, in, especially in Europe, but beyond as well. Uh, but failed banks have only one objective, and that is how to be bailed out without losing control of the bank. And if the price that has to be paid for this is austerity, they're quite happy to see this okay. go through. Uh, unfortunately, once there was this cynical transfer of banking losses 
from the books of the banks onto the public ledger, onto the shoulders of the weakest of taxpayers, yeah. then the politics became toxic in Europe, uh, as it is becoming toxic in the United States, uh, States of, of America. Um, finally, one last point which I think might resonate with you. The greater the capacity of businesses to drive a wedge between price and cost, and marginal cost in particular, the greater the excess capacity, and the less like, the, the more difficult it is to manage a macroeconomy during the downturn. Okay. This we, we, we knew from the 1930s, and it's a lesson that we have to relearn now. Okay. I'm going to come back to Yashin, because I have a, um, I remember um, 20 years ago or so, when I would talk to international relations people, they tended to be very, very upbeat about the future of democra democratic institutions in the world, because the view was that as, you, as countries grow richer, they would uh, inevitably become more democratically oriented, that, the, that, that, uh, that businesses would demand uh, a more liberal regime. Now, it looks not so certain. What, is, is it, what's, what's happening in, in China China's clearly top of the, of the question there. So that's known as a modernization theory. Right. Uh, so pro pro uh, proposed by uh, Martin Lipset uh, at Stanford in the 1960s. I think there are a number of nuances to, to that. One is that definitely if you look at the level of democracy, that has not changed, right? China has remained a uh, autocratic, right. authoritarian country. But I think this discussion is a little bit too binary for me. Uh, so the real issue, I think, is not democracy vis-a-vis -vis autocracy. It's really whether or not the country has become less authoritarian over time. Right? Yeah. So by that, so I'm Chinese, so I have very low standard. Right. Uh, so for me, the, the, relevant, the relevant question is whether or not China today is less authoritarian than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I think, you know, we may debate a little bit, but the, the, the answer has to be yes. It's less authoritarian. And the economic growth and market expansion, the rise of the private sector, and, and plus the information technology have all contributed to a lessening of the authoritarian nature of the political system. So essentially, there's a distinction between moving along the curve as opposed to shift of the curve. China has not gotten there, but it's moving along the, sh uh, okay. along the curve. What I would have said from, as we, we our two minutes of discussion in the green room, I have no idea about China. But, um, mm -hmm. I'm totally ignorant, but, but the impression, if, you, if you'd asked me, is China less authoritarian than it was 20 years ago? I would say, of course. Yeah. If you ask me, is it less authoritarian than it was three years ago? Sure, sure. Yeah. And what's happening there? Yeah. I mean, this is a tremendously successful economy. How can it be backsliding? Yeah. So, so, I, so, so then uh, economics is not everything, right? So as we say that, that, that uh, it's endogenous of uh, leadership, of a particular kind of leadership that you have, before the current leadership, China has had generations of leaders who are not Democrats, but you know, trending toward the liberal direction, right? right. And, and this is one of the big problem with the authoritarian system, because the leadership selection is a very unpredictable process. Nobody knew the characteristics of this current leader before he was selected. Okay. No, nobody knew. So, he had a lot of room to maneuver, and he decided to move backward. To me, this is extremely worrisome. So I don't worry if China is trending toward a more liberal direction. I do worry if China is trending backward. So you think that this is just a uh, more or less an accident? This is a, a personal thing? This is the, the monarch turns out to be a, that I, kind of guy? I think we, we have to, as a social scientist, we have to, we have to acknowledge that histories uh, have happened by contingencies. There are a lot of things that we can't just include in our model, and, and this is one of them, right? So you have this exogenous political shock that tipped it, that, that, that tilted the country in this direction. But I would say that, uh, that there's no incompatibility between uh, po politics and economics. As a result of political reversal, the Chinese economy is going to suffer. Uh, and, and the confidence of the private sector is declining. You and I talked about yeah. 
the capital fly to the tune of $1 trillion. Uh, this is uh, voting with your feet. Ross, um, you basically presented an optimistic picture. Mm -hmm. uh, information wants to be free, freedom mm -hmm. spreads. Uh, what could go wrong? Let me, let me say first that um, I have to take issue with some of the things that you said. Um, I think that uh, when we look at the world today and businesses today, there's actually been a fairly significant decentralization of power, both in terms of business. I mean, the history is filled with these conglomerates that worked hand in hand with government in the United States and everywhere around the world. When you look at the information technology sector, uh, we run scared at Google every single day because as successful as we've been, we know that the barrier to entry, there is none other than someone having a brilliant idea. And the, the history of the information technology sector is littered with the carcasses of companies once thought to be unassailable. Um, so incredible decentralization, I think, of business power and of power in general. I mean, before the internet, newspaper publishers, uh, television producers, government officials, media moguls determined what each of us consumed in terms of information and how we were able to communicate with each other. And that's completely changed. It's messy, as I said. And I'm an optimist, and I'll tell you why. Because I think open beats closed every single time. So it's not, it's not going to happen immediately. But I look at it in terms of those countries that are trying very hard to put the internet back in a box. You know, they're hiring the best engineers they can find, sometimes thousands of them. And they're, some of them are in Shanghai, as we know, in this PLA complex. And they're trying to shut down the internet, censor it, control it. I don't care how many engineers or very bright people a government hires, they're never going to be as smart or as powerful as everyone outside of that building. And so that's why I'm fundamentally an optimist. OK, I was actually just random, but uh, I, I was wondering whatever happened to the do not call uh, list in the US, which, which would stop you from getting commercial solicitations if you put yourself on the list. And it's the FCC's it's, do yeah, not call list? Yes, and it, it's, it's completely failed now. And apparently, it's all VOIP. It's all, uh, it's all because people who are outside the jurisdiction can. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, my home. My home landline has become unusable because of all this. You the still have a home landline? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> only, only, I couldn't only I don't know the number. I only, don't know the number. <laughs> <laughs> only back in New Jersey. Um, okay. Sorry, I couldn't uh, resist, Paul. So yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Let me, so let me. I, I'm a little surprised. Well, let me raise. Uh, the stuff that I, I, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said, oh, that's, that's just too extreme, but I now take very seriously um, about the relationship, and it's, it's for you, Giannis. Um, the, um, so it turns out, one of the great, in my, in my line, one of the great uh, frustrations has been that we have this, this great recession, and, and, and we basically knew what to do. And it's, you know, monetary policy hits its limit, but there's fiscal policy, and certainly in the United States, there was never any real constraint uh, on doing more, and, and in, even even in the European system, at least some countries had room. But but we have not. We've actually um, uh, had a, we we've had an obsession with with uh, with fiscal balance, even at a time when when borrowing costs are essentially zero. And um, and some people actually uh, have resurrected, brought back to our attention, an old essay by by Kolesky, in which he said that business. Um, you would think that businesses would want policies that boost the economy because it's good for business, but that they end up uh, being against it because they want a, a psychology in which people feel that the only way to have a good economic situation is to have the confidence of business. And if you say that, well, but the government can create jobs, that takes away a big part of their power. Do you see any of that story? I mean, I've, I've ended up actually believing that that is true for the United States, at least. It is true in the case of the United States. It's not, the, it's not true in the case of the, United, of the European Union. Okay. The European Union is a much deeper uh, mire. Um, we have much more serious uh, structural design faults to deal okay. with. Uh, and therefore, in my, my experience in Europe 
is that business was much more progressive in demanding an end to austerity, and is to this day, right. uh, than, than governments are. In the United States, I can see that entirely. But in Europe, the, the, the reason is, and it's, oops, it's connected to the, uh, to, to the topic today. Come to think of it, the difference between the federal government in the United States and Brussels yeah. is fundamental and political and connected to what we're talking about. In the United States, like in Britain, like in Germany, uh, government evolved as a result of social conflicts. So initially it was the aristocrats versus the, the merchants, then the trade unions came in, and so on and so forth. It was a way, democracy is not a luxury, it is an evolving mechanism for managing conflicts, especially during periods of crisis. This is why in the United States you became a genuine federation uh, after lots of, you know, a sequence of crises, so the last one being the Great Depression. Uh, in Europe, our government, if you want to think of it that way, right. the European Union, began as a cartel, a cartel of heavy industry. The first name was the European Community of Coal and Steel. Right. It's like, imagine if OPEC, the bureaucracy of OPEC, had to evolve into a democratic government. It simply cannot be done. So the, the reason why in Europe we are in a situation where business does not con um, comply with the Kaletsky <laughs> argument, which applies in the United States, because in Europe, we have a crisis that was utterly avoidable, but could only be avoided through the kind of democratic politics that is impeded by the cartel-like um, functioning of Brussels. And yet, in these days, uh, I mean, does, outside of banks, I, I, I don't seem to f have the sense that, that business has much of a voice or it has a much of a presence in, in, the, in the corridors of, of, of the Berlaymont. I mean, you just don't get that feeling that, 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 the, that European policy has anything, any, actually anything like the, the lobbying efforts in the United States. Am I wrong? This is quite right, except for the bankers. So, okay. So it's a bank, it, this business is good, but banks are evil. That's, uh, that's, our, that's the takeaway. <laughs> Which, by the way, <laughs> remain no. insolvent in reality. That's right. Um, okay. Actually, I believe I think we have the ability to take questions um, because we have limited time and I think people might want to. Can we do that? Is there a, a method? Maybe not. There's no question. Okay, well, some, okay, let me just try and, oh, there we go. Yes. Stasinopoulos, formerly with the European Commission. Uh, we hear a lot about the, let's say, uh, the capacity of our governments to deal with issues of uh, taxation, inequality of income and poverty is severely constrained by the power of big business. Uh, that's uh, something that we read on a daily basis even in the press. My question is of course, how this is impacted on the public debate is the result of this kind of, let's say, a control of media, control of the political process by the big business, uh, affected very much or distort the public debate? That's a, a, a okay. very important question for me for the panel. And then the second one is, I see one area in which the conflict is quite severe, is the issue of taxation between governments and, and big business. And very few countries, they have been to somehow reconcile, let's say, the two points of views on the issue of taxation. Okay, does anybody have a, a thought on to what extent your business interests are constraining the public debate? Are there things that we can't talk about? I, I'm, I, I mean, I, I, my, my take is, is the, I, I don't see that quite so much, but this is a U.S. perspective. I see that, more, there is the, this sense that, uh, that if you want to know what we should do about the economy, you should ask a, a successful business person, which is actually a terrible idea. It's just that they're just dif different disciplines. But I don't know. Does anyone have a thought? Well, just very briefly, I'll just go back to something Ross said before, yeah. and which I uh, quoted before again. He's right. Don't conflate all business. There, are, okay. there is a special segment of business, and particularly the media, especially media that is financially and fiscally stressed and connected yep. in uh, and we all are, by the way. ways to banks that are 
stressed, right? Uh, yeah. That is a nexus of uh, um, poisonous influence upon the democratic debate, which is seriously affected in this way. Okay. By the way, I'm going to throw in a, another sort of odd observation. Um, banks, the role of the, the power of banks uh, in, in the decision-making process, I think my, my personal experience is it comes partly from the revolving door. There's something that's much more likely at government officials that their next stop is, is somewhere in the financial industry, but also comes from the fact that bankers are very good at, at this. They're slick. They tend to be smart and funny and, and have great tailors, and, uh, um, and they, they, they have a ability to sound as if they know what the right answer is that, that I think in general, you know, people in the cement industry don't, and it, uh, it, it, it has a, a real problem. Okay, another question someplace. <laughs> right in the middle here, can we? Yeah. yeah, I'm just going randomly, but. Hi, um, so I have a uh, suggestion, uh, and I want to see what you think about it, which is that businesses actually pull political systems towards an oligarchy. And so when the starting point is, is an autocracy, we mistake that as a move towards a democracy because we, they are expanding um, the number of people who have access to power, right? And whereas if you start from the point of a democracy, you see this sort of, you know, revolving door, door sort of um, under, uh, t uh, t a toxic um, undermining of, um, of, of a democratic institution. And so, so what do you think of as that as perhaps an explanation for why we see these um, two conflicting, seemingly uh, conflict, conflicting observations in different countries with regards to the effects of businesses on um, the political system. Maybe Yashin, do you have a thought? Yeah. So I, I think that's a critical observation. It's very important for us to specify the starting point, right? If we start from an autocracy, we tend to view the rise of business as a check and balance on the unlimited power of the government, right? So it is contributing to the, maybe not democracy, but it is contributing to uh, diversification of uh, political voices. I mean, you have a lot of problem with media uh, in Europe, in China. We welcome the rise of media. We welcome Google, but Google chose to leave us. And, uh, we didn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, uh, so. And, and, and uh, uh, Baidu and, and these uh, uh, unofficial uh, uh, internet uh, media, it has contributed to a public dialogue that we, could, we couldn't even imagine before, right? So it's very important to be specific about the starting point. Many people do not, they simply replicate what they view as the problem in the West as a, uh, as a, as a, uh, as a basis for solution to the problem in countries like China, right? So that's just absolutely wrong because they're not mindful of the starting uh, position. In China, the rise of the private sector has done tremendous in terms of uh, uh, diluting the power of the government. If you look at where the growth has happened the, the, the fastest in China, it tends to happen where the private business is very, very strong, and it tends to happen where the incremental political reforms uh, have, uh, have happened. So, and, and now the business is beginning to develop a independent but careful voice. And, and, and because of the leadership uh, uh, change, some business people have uh, expressed their, their, their opinions by leaving the country. So I think this is a, a welcome development in China. I just want to. Google did not leave China. We, um, well, the search engine did, No, we right? did. Look, yeah. I, I, this is yeah. pretty important because there is this common perception that Google just packed up, we just packed up our bags and left. I led Asia Pacific policy for three years. I was sent out there in the middle of it, at the beginning of the China crisis to deal with this. We made a very conscious decision to remain in China, but we did move our search engine outside of China because it was subjected to such harsh and constant censorship. So we have incredibly talented people in Beijing and in Shanghai working there today. I wanted to address, it's come up a couple times, Paul, this idea of the revolving door uh, and that as being a horrible thing. I have a slightly different perspective. I, I mean, we need regulations, we need transparency about it, but I much prefer a system in which our government officials are informed by a life outside of government. 
whether they be civil society, some time in business, <coughs> academia, rather than this static bureaucracy that exists with government officials starting their career and ending their career in the same building. I'd rather see us have a system where, as you did, Mr. Minister, you had a life before of it, and that informed your role in government. And I think that's very healthy in a democracy and necessary. Okay. I mean, I, I, my uh, personal class interest is I'm all in favor of the revolving door between government and academia. I think that the revolving door between business and, and government is very bad. Thanks and Why? Why No, I don't. I don't actually. But it's, oh, just don't. A, it's just my personal stake. No, no, we actually have a, an issue right now. Uh, I'm going to take okay. one more question. Can, can I, I just can. make one little point yeah. uh, on the question? Look, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Our democracies are oligarchic. Of course. They were intended to be. If you read the Federalist Papers, they were intended to keep the hoi polloi out and to simply represent them and have a consultation process. Business with technological innovations like the ones that you so magnificently turn out is always going to have a capacity to monopolize power or oligopolize power. We know that. Right. You mentioned, Ross, and you are quite right, that you know, if it wasn't for your magnificent search engine, you would not have acquired the, the market power you have and that you are always wary of the next good idea that will render you obsolete and into a dinosaur. But it will take some time. Meanwhile, you are not only acquiring power through innovation, you acquire power through acquisition and through standard mechanisms of monopoly capital. Now, this is not a criticism, this is a fact. You should be aware of that. You should not hide from this fact. And as a good citizen, you should find ways of curtailing your own power and encouraging government to impose regulations on you regarding the, uh, the, the, the uh, recycling between business and... Yeah, I, I, absolutely. We do not want to have compartments, comp compartmentalization. But at the same time, it is absolutely essential to make sure that power does not spill over from the realm of monopoly capital onto the democratic political realm. Okay, I think we take one more question. Make it uh, short, please. Uh, back. Uh, there's someone there. Just turn it up. Sorry about the arbitrariness of the. Thank you. Uh, James Wright, American School of Classical Studies. Uh, we haven't been talking that much about specific businesses, but we have Google represented. Would you care to comment on the role of weapons industries, national and private, and democracy? Wow, does anybody have a thought there? <laughs> Don't know anything about I mean, it's, it's, it is the classic, uh, I mean, merchants of death and all of that. And uh, uh, we are not hearing a lot of that lately. I'm not sure. Well, but NRA, right? So if you think about That's NRA right. as in the pocket of the weapons industry, That's they have a huge influence and monopoly of power over American politics. Actually, that's right. exactly right. The NRA is not, it appears, it, it poses as an as a organization of hunters and, no, and people who love not, guns, right? but it's actually the, it's actually the, the weapons, it's, it's the actually weapons the producers. Weapons, weapons companies yeah, uh, yeah. With, uh, uh, behind the front. So that's a perfect example. Yeah. And also, let's not forget, that the, at least in the United States, the relationship between the defense uh, budget, the Pentagon, and technology has always been very, very strong. In a way, it was a way of, uh, an, invest, yes. an aggregate investment program into research and development. You would not have existed, uh, Apple would not have existed without uh, the military budget of the United States. And also, there is, this, this is not a criticism. Right. Let's face that the fact that there is a very strong relation. I be believe Eric Schmidt has been working with the Pentagon for many years. Um, again, this is not a criticism, but we must face up to the facts before we bring about the kind of institutional changes that maximize the chance, the chance of democratic control over our lives. I think that's a good ending point. So <laughs> thank you all. Thanks, everybody. And to our next.